I remember someone saying to me, there's this offer come in, come in for you to go and play an elf in New Zealand. I went, oh, an elf in New Zealand. And I said, what's the, the story? And they said, oh, it's from The Lord of the Rings. I went, oh, someone's making The Lord of the Rings. And I said, who's directing it? Peter Jackson. I stopped speaking and they said, yeah, you don't want to do that, do you? They didn't realize why I wasn't speaking. It was like the perfect job. The Aviator. I uh, read in the magazines that you play golf. On occasion. Well, how about nine holes? Now, Mr. Hughes. If it would be convenient, Miss Hepburn. I played Catherine Hepburn in The Aviator. It was about Howard Hughes, and they obviously had a, a very public, although they tried to keep it clandestine, love affair. His love of cinema, her love of daring. I remember I was working on a Western with Ron Howard. I had just had a baby, and my eldest was learning to walk in the snow, and it was kind of idyllic, and I was riding out with Marlboro men every day, and it doesn't get much better than this. And then I got a call saying that Martin Scorsese was trying to get hold of me. He had a script he wanted to send me, and I nearly buckled at the knees. I think I was so nervous talking to him because I knew whatever it was he was asking me to do, I was gonna say yes. And then it was to play Catherine Hepburn. I went, okay, this is the end of my career. <laughs> the film will be amazing because he's, you know, he's the maestro, but yeah, I was terrified. I remember the first time I saw Sylvia Scarlett and I was just, blown away, and then seeing Philadelphia Story and all of those fantastic screwball comedies. How are you, dear? Much better now that you're here. Ah, oh, I guess this must be love, huh? Your guess is correct, Mr. Connor. I'm just his faithful old dog, Trey. She's so extraordinary. There was no one like her. What's that on the steering wheel? Cellophane. If you had any idea the crap that people carry around on their hands. What kind of crap? You don't want to know. Well, the first thing is you have to attack the most obvious parts of the character, like the way they move, the way they speak, which was so distinctive with Hepburn. But then the most important thing is you've got to say to the director, what's the world that I'm entering? Because this is not a film about Catherine Hepburn. I had to fit into that the story that he was telling. And he was so fantastic the way he said to me, you look great blonde. You can just be blonde and you don't have to sound like her. I mean, gosh, your voice was so annoying. You know, or, you know, he was just trying to make me feel better. And it was so liberating that he said that to me because it, it just removed any um, residual feeling that I would have to get it right. I then just said to myself, I'm playing a character in a Martin Scorsese. Right. film. But the wonderful thing that, that Scorsese does, and I'm sure he does it with all of his films, is that he screened a set of films that had an energy to how he wanted me to, to play the character. So he screened about four or five different films that gave us a tone and a texture and a world in which to play. He wanted the first entry of Hepburn into the story to sort of knock your head back. Follow through is everything in golf, just like life. <laughs> Don't you find? <laughs> in the same way that she must have done that with audiences the first time they'd seen her, the energy that she brought onto screen. I adore the theater, only alive on stage. I'll teach you. We'll see some Ibsen. Yeah. If the Republicans have an outlaw at him by now. <laughs> You're not a Republican, are you? Couldn't abide that. How did uh, you vote in 32? Well, I didn't. You must. It's your sacred franchise. But what was, when I saw the film, what I love seeing was obviously when Hepburn and Howard Hughes are broken up and he's locked himself in his screening room. And obviously when I played that scene with Leo, he was on the other side of the door. So I never saw his side of it, just what I imagined, because even his voice was so painful to listen to. I can't, sweetie. You mean you won't? And then to see the visual on the other side was really heartbreaking. Lord of the Rings. Who could have known? Except all of us uh, fanboys and girls. I mean, I was there to work with Peter Jackson. I was yeah. such a huge fan of his work and his reverence and his, his, you know, his love of kind of the ugly side of of things. You were a fan of his horror works. And I, I love. I grew up on horror, and so all of that brain dead stuff. I mean, I just absolutely loved it. 
I loved it. And it was so funny, you know, as, as well as being so revolting and creepy. Party's over. And so imagining his sensibility on those stories, which were sort of like a holy grail of, of, of a certain aspect of the, you know, the literary canon. I thought this is going to be really, because you have to ask yourself when you're adapting something so beloved and that has such a particular and special place for people, why, what are you going to do with it? But who could have known that it would have taken off in the way that it did? First voice, the very first thing we hear. Yes, it began with the forging of the great rings. Three were given to the elves, immortal, wisest and fairest of all beings. I think it was in the original scripts, but I d don't think I fully computed that it would be the first thing. Because when you first pick up a script to read it, you're reading the story. They were all very interested in, which I found really exciting, the fact that in order to become a force for good, or positive strength, you have to have confronted the darkness within. And so they were very interested, even though I don't think the book necessarily leans into that heavily, although they found their Tolkien justifications for it. Yeah. They were interested in the small way, you know, the bit that I'm in, teasing apart the, the idea of the darkness that could have been unleashed in her, that she too has been tempted by the ring. Yeah. I remember filming that, not knowing you know, because Pete was kind of just experimenting with it and not knowing that necessarily it was going to be in the final film. Right? Gives so much depth to the character. Yeah, I think so, yeah. How's your experience with The Hobbit coming back to the, the character? Oh, well, I, I mean, I knew there wasn't a snowflake's chance in hell of me being reprising my role in that, but I sent kind of a jokey email to Pete saying, you know, if you want to put Galadriel in, I'm free, I'll come over. <laughs> you know, I'll sail my canoe. But I loved it. I loved it. It was really special. I mean, I was there for three weeks on The Lord of the Rings, and I think I might have been, you know, on The Hobbit, might have been there three days. Oh, yeah. But it was really special Different nonetheless, experience. yeah. Did you sign on when Guillermo del Toro was still attached, or? Yeah, yeah, I think he was yeah. originally, yeah. Yeah, it's still out there in my mind, this alternate universe where he, you know, his version of it. I love yeah, too. they're both such special directors and really particular, and you can totally see the crossover. But yet they, you know, they make things and they create worlds in their own unique ways. I mean, you know, it would have been equally as special, but just different. Thor Ragnarok. I don't play Thor. I wasn't asked to play Thor. Well, you know, Natalie Portman played Thor. In well, yes. I know. Yeah. They were big muscles. I, That's right. a lot of work. A lot of work. That wasn't CGI. You must be Hella. I'm Thor, son of Odin. Really? You don't look like him. Perhaps we can come to an arrangement. You sound like him. Neil. I beg your pardon. Well, I'd seen Tyker's films and loved them. I'd heard that it was happening, but I didn't think anything of it. And then um, I just got a call saying that Taika wanted to meet. And would I, I said, yeah, of course. And I didn't know what he, I just well, he wanted to say hello. And then he asked, would I be in it? You know, Marvel aren't necessarily used to having a whole script. So there wasn't anything, you know, often they'll, they'll, they will board the, the essential battles and they'll, they'll start working backwards. Like they, they make their stories, construct their stories. You know, it's a whole big, massive jigsaw puzzle that I don't know. What I didn't realize then was the first time a female villain had been realized on screen. So that was really exciting. Who are you? What have you done with Thor? I'm Hela. But I knew Taika was going to put his own particular spin on it. Yeah. And that Chris was so up for anything, incredibly generous and funny and ready to kind of move this in another direction. So it felt like there was a really playful, exciting energy. Fresh winds were, were moving through. It was great. It was really great. And I mean, I learned so much. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, literally just to, which I was still doing on Borderlands, not to go pew, pew when you shoot the guns. Because you have to throw a lot of stuff out of your whatever bits are going to be CGI'd onto your hand. You know, hammer throwing lessons from Chris about how it could actually make it like it's an, a mime. Right. You had to have energy through your arm. I mean, yeah. I did. I learned a lot of soft skills. You want Asgard? 
It's yours. Whatever game you're playing, it won't work. You can't defeat me. No, I know. But he can't. It's a really huge action scene that was all shot outdoors. And Zoe Bell had come out of retirement to be Hella's stunt double. Oh my God, I learned so much from Zoe. She's so deeply cool. So to work with Zoe and to do my bits and to watch her do this incredible stuff was just like, oh, my jaw hit the floor. She's amazing. Tar. I'm probably the wrong person to ask since I don't uh, read reviews. Never, really. No, but it is odd. I, I think that anyone ever felt compelled to substitute maestro with maestra. I mean, we don't call uh, women astronauts, astronauts. <laughs> it's definitely um, uh, a, a, a tragedy. Oftentimes in tragedy, we forget, you know, that we think about the, the forces that cause the downfall or the tragic unfolding of events as being external to the central characters yeah. who we're asked to invest in, but to watch something where the tragedy occurs from an implosion mm -hmm. as much as an explosion was a really interesting thing to, to, to play, which is hard. I found it hard, very hard film to talk about. It connected with me so, so deeply that I didn't want to become too conscious of it. I didn't want to tell an audience what to make of it because I felt there were so many things brought to bear that we didn't really get a space to talk about. So for me, the, the, the film existed on a metaphorical layer and as much as it existed literally. I think people got really obsessed with the literal kind of circumstances, which are quite, uh, d not quite, they are elusive and mysterious. Yeah. So it became a little bit, a little bit of a Rorschach test for how, how people read the film or read the situation and yeah. what they thought was said or what they just interpreted. Based on their experiences with so many other stories that are like happening. Yeah, it's interesting. We, we, if we get one or two whiffs of a certain story, we often lean into that side of the narrative yeah. rather than allowing the story to unfold. And I think that happens a lot with all of us conversationally is that yeah. we think we understand what someone's saying yeah. and we start to formulate judgments and perceptions of what is going to be said rather than allowing that person's narrative to genuinely unfold, yeah. unfettered by our own sense of judgment. great physical performance from you as, <laughs> as the conductor. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It was terrifying. It was terrifying. I was actually shooting Borderlands in, in Hungary, like a film made from a video game, preparing for, for this. And obviously lockdown was still alive and kicking. And so none of the opera houses were open. I couldn't have piano lessons mm -hmm. in person. I was able to finally, I found a great piano teacher in Budapest, Emma Shea Virag. And, uh, and so she could finally teach me face to face. And she took me into the concert halls and, but all of the music um, had to be chosen and learnt. And so I was having Zoom, a lot of Zoom calls about that stuff. But it was so great. It was a little bit like when I was preparing to play Bob Dylan, but I was playing Elizabeth I. Lydia Tarr and Borderlands were never going to insect. Although, if you think about the last image of where she ends up at a, you know, a video game conference, there's an irony there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was Monster Hunters, yeah. Sisters and brothers of the Fifth Fleet, it's time. I remember being on set with Jamie Lee Curtis and um, she was, uh, Jamie Lee, like she needs a surname. <laughs> you know, she was asking me what I was doing because I was sort of moving in a strange way. And I had the score for, for Marla's Fifth out and I was trying to put my annotations in about, you know, because I was having lessons and she just, she just laughed, you know. Just the absurdity of preparing that role while being on the set of Borderlands. Blue Jasmine. You know, and I, I can't be alone, Ginger. I really get some bad thoughts when I'm alone. Well, you know, all I can say is you look great. Oh, uh, now who's lying? <laughs> you know, I was up all last night. I was so anxious about moving here. Yeah. I wasn't sure how angry you still were. You know, I played Jasmine in Blue Jasmine, and she is someone who has married out of her hood 
uh, where her sister still uh, lives and has kind of, well, totally reinvented herself, like streets away from where she grew up. She gets divorced and she's got no money and she has to go back to her sister. So it's a little bit like, if you think about streetcar named Desire, the Tennessee Williams kind of through a, a sort of an Upper East Side Woody Allen lens and yeah. that's kind of where you are. You from out here? New York, Park Avenue. You know, when my husband passed away, I mean, Naturally, I was very upset, so I decided to come out here and start a new life for myself. What did he do? He was a surgeon. Famously, most of the film takes place in San Francisco, and I think it's one of the great San Francisco movies. It is. I thought initially that we were shooting in San Francisco because of the streetcars, but there was a scene in a streetcar that then he cut out. So okay. I don't think he wanted comparisons made to it. But certainly from my perspective, because uh, there's no time to shoot anything, often really long takes or just one take. <laughs> My husband and I ran sort of like the de facto national theater in Australia. Mm -hmm. And in our first season, I think we programmed a production of Streetcar, which Liv Ullman directed. Mm -hmm. And so I had played and we toured a lot. And so I'd lived with the circumstances of that play for a really long time. I'm very slow. And so I felt that I could bring a lot of that just subterranean understanding of the circumstances of those sets of relationships into that film, which yeah. was really helpful because we were moving so quickly. The end scene we shot and then we had to redo it again, which I thought, oh God, it was such a kind of a, a state to be in. It's fraught with peril. He gossip, I talk. I saw Danny. I think he wanted to rewrite it, but then you think, oh well, I do that every night in the theater, so I can go back and do it again. And it's actually, it's happened a few times where you've had to go back and reshoot something. And often if you felt like you as a group of people had, had, had got somewhere approximating something that was interesting, it can be a bit disappointing, but it's always fascinating doing it a second time. Yeah. You know, having another go at it. On a weekend in Palm Beach means I can wear what can I wear? I can wear the Dior dress that I bought in Paris. Yes, my black dress. Well, Hal always used to surprise me with jewelry. Extravagant pieces. If you listen to people, you know, like me being Australian, I will become, my accent will become stronger when I'm in certain environments. Well, I slip into where I am, much to the embarrassment of my children. You listen to a lot of people who have um, trans, like I've lived in England for a, a long time and I've got friends who've lived in England for less time but they sound more British than I do right. because this has been where, they, where they've taken off or deeply connected with and something's, you know, um, transformative have, has happened in that particular place so that it really does shift them into yeah. an... And then some people never lose their accent right. no matter where they move. Yeah. But I think Jasmine is one of those people who's a real survivor. And so it was important fitting in and eradicating her past. It was, a, you know, an act of survival. You say Australians are the best at doing accents. You think? Being colonized by the British, I guess, you know, <laughs> and also culturally colonized by the Americans. And there's not a lot of call for Australian characters internationally, you know, unless you're working at home. I'd love to see you in the next Mad Max picture. There we go, speak to George. And some horror films too, I think. We're I gonna know, get you gotta get me into a few. I'm not there. It's the process itself that's a fool. Who cares what I think? I'm not the president. I'm not some shepherd. I'm just a storyteller, man. That's all I am. What's Todd Haynes, you know, you may have seen his work, Carol, or more recently, May, The May December, which is extraordinary. Made a film about Bob Dylan where he divided Dylan's persona into, I think it was seven different uh, personas, eras, personalities, and actors, and I play one of them. Heath Ledger was playing one, and Christian and Michelle Williams was also in my particular section. We weren't all there at the same time, but I was wildly excited by, you know, Richard Gere on horseback and this yeah. whole Western and take on it. I played the version of Bob Dylan when he went electric on the 68 tour. Just like I am, but everybody wants you to be. 
maybe the most fun version. Oh God, it was so much fun. I love the Highway 61. And I, I was preparing for it when I was playing Queen Elizabeth and I was watching all the, the outtakes for the Penny Baker documentary and the Penny Baker documentary on a loop. But to see the, you know, um, all of the press conferences he did in Stockholm and in Paris and yeah. here in London and his interface with the media, mm. it was crazy. They just did not know. You'd see these people literally not knowing what to make. They, was, was that an answer? Is he playing with us? Yeah. It was so formal, the interaction with the press and the expectations were so absolute that artists had to make sense, that they had to justify their work, that they had to tell an audience what to think. He was just not going to, yeah. to do that. Some have questioned, given your latest recordings, whether or not you still care about people as you once did. Yeah, but, uh, you know, we all have our own definitions of all those words. You know, uh, care and uh, people. Well, I think we all know the definition of people. <laughs> yeah. Do we? Are you looking forward to the Timothy Chalamet biopic? Yeah, be curious. I mean, yeah. there's so much to say to to hang off that 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 life. It doesn't all necessarily have to be true. Movies aren't necessarily um, uh, the 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 facts of the thing, but they're often the feeling of the thing. Yeah, you know. Carol, what was your favorite doll when you were four? Me. I never, not many to be honest. I'm sorry, you're not allowed to smoke on the sales floor. Oh, of all, forgive me, shopping makes me nervous. Who is Carol? Well, I, it's, she's a, um, a creation in the mind of Patricia Highsmith. Phyllis Nage did the screenplay, which was just superb. Um, and finally Todd came on board to direct it. And I think it's hard to remember because so much has changed and still needs to change about representation on screen and the type of same-sex relationships that could were being explored, and they weren't being made. I mean, it was not that far apart, I think, from the, the lack of kind of non-suicidal tragic endings that, that came from same-sex stories. It was a pretty arid landscape in the mainstream. Yeah. And so I was so excited and moved that, that the film has resonated with and continues to resonate with people, you know, because I think that Todd's impact on the way those types of stories get told is so sensitive and powerful and timeless. A photographer. I think so, if I have any talent for it. Isn't that something other people let you know you have? And all you can do is keep working. Use what feels right, throw away the rest. I suppose so. Will you show me your work? It was really, really important to the look of the film to shoot on 16 millimeter. It dictated how long our takes could be, but I knew it was super important to the look of the film in order to try and make, when it ultimately got transferred to digital, to give it a kind of a softness and a depth and a richness of color, which Ed Lachman, who I've worked with several times now, which he's such a genius cinematographer. It just meant that what we, we that you had to be really all focused because the, you couldn't let the thing run long. The times I've worked with Todd, I've always felt that the sets are really intimate. Mm -hmm. He really creates that environment where, obviously, with an incredible eye, an immense skill set, and um, and such a kind of a um, a porous but sure perspective on the stories that he's telling. But yet, he creates this feeling like we're just making a student film. So there's a kind of feels like a liberating, risk-taking quality that he creates on his sets, which is really quite remarkable. Borderlands. Hunters. You've come in search of the secret lost vault of Pandora. I play Lilith in Borderlands, which has been transposed from that amazing video game. And I get dropped back into my home planet, kicking and screaming, which is in Pandora, to try and find a vault which I don't even think exists. Having gone through kind of the Lord of the Rings, which was 
sort of at the beginning of all of that technology really coming to the fore and then to be playing Hela in the Marvel, in, in Thor, where there was a lot of green screen yeah. and a lot of mocap suits. I had sort of thought Borderlands, oh, it's from a video game. Of course, it's going to be in an ILM stage and I'm going to have dots all over my face or a camera in front of my, it's all going to be done in post. And I'm going to be scanned and I'm going to go home. When Eli came on board to direct it, which is how I heard about it, he said, no, I really, he loved Hodorowsky, those Sergio Leone, it's the, the Westerns where oh, you can yeah. feel the grit. You know how how hot it is and you, people are sweating and he wanted it to be kind of a bit more sweaty. Yeah. And so that stuff was, you know, that's where I got my idea of having fingerless gloves. So I, it, 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 I, when I heard those references and knew it was going to be shot on the ground in Budapest and I was actually going to be on stage with real people because of course this, this was during the pandemic that we shot it. I was so excited by all of those elements.